Hi everyone. So you've probably noticed from the different examples we've been working on and other problems you might have been trying to solve that states in a Markov chain often share characteristics with other states that maybe are in a similar position on a directed graph or uh, that the states happen to communicate with or some, something seems to be going on there. And uh, we're going to start today by uh, making that a little bit more concrete. And so we're going to introduce communicating classes. So we're just going to try to make all those ideas, um, you know, specific. Okay, so we're going to start off with a proposition. Um, that the proof and the proof of this proposition uh, is sort of a funny one. Two parts of it are really trivial and kind of they're, they're so obvious it's difficult to even um, think of a way to write a proof. It seems like it's just in the statement. Um, and then the third part um, takes a little bit of work uh, and we'll leave it to you in the notes. But so here's the proposition. So the proposition is that um, communication between states um, is an equivalence relation. So in case you've forgotten, communication means like, for example, when you do this, you say I and J communicate with each other. In other words, J is, is accessible from I and I is accessible from J. Uh, so communication uh, between states is an equivalence relation on S. Um, and so what that, this is a formal term, um, what that means is that it has three properties. And so the first two are going to be um, very, very obvious that they're true. Um, and so the first one is called reflexive, and it says that every state I communicates with itself. So this is the reflexive property. And this is trivially true because um, we have set it up so that uh, it's, it counts as uh, being accessible if it's accessible in zero steps. So uh, you're automatically able to access the state that you're originally in. Um, property two uh, is called symmetric, a symmetric property, and that says that if I communicates with J, uh, then it implies that uh, J communicates with I. So this is called symmetric property. And that's clearly true. That's just uh, the nature of communication. Uh, so, that, so these are the two sort of very obvious uh, parts of the proposition. Um, and the third, third prop part uh, is maybe a little less obvious. Um, it takes a little more work to prove. And that's, that's the transitive property. And it says that if the following thing is true, if it's true that I and J communicate, and it's true that J and K communicate, then it implies that I and K communicate. And I guess for that, you might you might want to look at the proof in the notes. Uh, but so I'll just put over your proof in notes. Or left a reader if you want. Um, we won't do that proof here. Okay, now as a result of this uh, equivalence relation, we can partition the, the sample space S. So we can, the whole point of this, we can partition S into disjoint equivalence classes. 
All right, and we're going to name them um, communicating classes. So these are like, we're going to name them. The notation we'll use for them is capital D. So D1, D2, and so on. So that's just the symbols that we're going to use for them. So these equivalence classes, D1 and D2 and so on, we're going to call these communicating classes. All right, so that's, and that's the topic of this part of the lecture. And so just as an example, uh, let's dig up one of our previous um, graphs that we looked at. Uh, I'm going to look at one from the previous lecture, so I'm going to jump over there and get it. Uh, it's here. So we'll copy this one. Like this. So this is our little example from before. Or one, of, one of our examples. I think it's maybe the last one we did. Um, but so for this example, if you look at these different states and try to characterize, you know, who, wh which of these states communicate with each other, um, you get kind of the following list. So one, one, uh, one is accessible from three. Um, two and three communicate. And three and four communicate. Four and five are almost, so five is accessible from four. And five and six communicate. So we have these two different classes here. And all the states are in there with the exception of one, um, which obviously communicates with itself. Um, and so these are the three different uh, classes. So we'll say class number one is just state one. Class number two is two, three, four. States two, three, and four. And class number three is states five and six. Okay, now we're going to introduce a proposition uh, that tells something about what these states uh, share. And we won't prove this proposition. It's, it's just omitted. Oops, there we go. So the proposition. Once you have these communicating classes, what does that tell you? So suppose that you start off by just saying you have two states that communicate. So let's say let i and j communicate, right? Then the following four things are going to be true. So one is that i is recurrent if and only if j is recurrent. So that's part one. Uh, part two is that, is, so that we're basically going to have three versions of this. Um, the same is true for null recurrent. And the same is true for positive recurrent. And lastly, if two if if one of the states is periodic with some period tau, then so is the other one. All right, so if i is periodic with period tau, uh, this is true if and only if j is periodic with period tau as well. Um, and so we'll leave this the proof for this. Uh, we won't show you. Um, so in essence, what we're saying is the following thing. So if you have a communicating class, all the states, they have the same type. 
same type. Um, and this guy goes by the name of class solidarity. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, that's the gist of this theorem here, or proposition, I guess. Okay, uh, now we're going to introduce a, a couple of, a few definitions. Uh, the first two uh, we'll use a little bit, and the third we'll use a lot more. So the definition, the first one we want to look at is to say what it means for a Markov chain to be irreducible. So we'll say a Markov chain is irreducible if it has only one class. In other words, so the sample space S is just equal to D1, right? So I, I should highlight these definitions. I think I, would, I, sh I didn't do that in the last one, but I should have. Um, and I, sh I should highlight this is a, describes the chain. The whole Markov chain is irreducible. OK, the next one. Uh, a Markov chain itself is called ergodic. So Markov chain is ergodic which is a word that we've used already just to describe states. Um, and so you can kind of guess maybe what this definition is about. It's if the, if the chain itself is irreducible and if all the states are ergodic. So that's the definition of what it means for a Markov chain to be ergodic. And you should probably maybe go back and look at the previous lecture to see what it means for something to be ergodic. Um, and here I've got it. You can see I've added in the highlights. I don't think I had that when I did the recording. Um, so we say that this, a state is ergodic if it's positive occurrent, meaning that you are, we will return to it uh, in a finite time, and it's aperiodic. So if all the states in a chain fit that description, and if they're all in uh, one communicating class, then we say that the chain is ergodic. Uh, OK, next thing we're going to introduce is something called the stationary distribution. OK, so it's the stationary distribution is a uh, a particular type of state occupation distribution vector. So let's say you have a state occupation distribution vector. And we introduced that, I think, in the last lecture. So just I'll just remind you. So that means you have some row vector. So this is a row vector. For us, you might find other uh, sources using it as a column vector, but I have not actually. Um, so it looks like this: it's a function of time, uh, which we're using, we're labeling with n, and it's defined in this way so that uh, the jth component of it, u j, at time n, is just given by the the probability that xn is equal to j. OK. Um, so that's a state occupation distribution vector. Um, we say that this is a stationary vector if, if the special circumstances occur. So we say it is a stationary uh, distribution. 
um, and we label that uh, with the symbol lowercase pi, a bit of an unfortunate notation, I think. I feel like maybe you shouldn't be using pi as a variable, but okay. I can't break with convention, as we've said. <laughs> um, so the state, the stationary distribution, we label that as pi, and it's it obeys the following. If you remember from the previous lecture, you can increment the time argument of a state occupation distribution vector by multiplying it um, by the one-step transition probability matrix. Um, and so we say it's a stationary distribution if nothing happens when you do that. So if the following happens, when you multiply it by the one-step transition probability matrix, um, you just get back the same vector. And the following condition is also true. We require this as well. All right, so that second requirement um, is just an honesty condition, right? Um, if you sum over all of the different states, um, the probability that the system is in one of them that is in is in each of them has to has to add up to one. Uh, the system has to be in some state. Um, so these two conditions make the stationary distribution. And so um, the thing to see here, I think it probably jumps out at you. Um, so I better highlight this is stationary distribution is that this is this is finding the stationary distribution is potentially pretty interesting. And it's clearly an eigenvalue problem. Um, but it's a special eigenvalue problem in that, so, so this makes it an eigenvalue problem, um, but it's special in two different ways. Uh, so let me just make this, this comment. So notice or note. To, I'm going to mention two different things. So this first one is that um, this guy is a, a left eigenvector, so pi. is a left eigenvector. Of the matrix P, um, but it has an eigenvalue of one. So it's not just any eigenvector, it's, it's one that has an eigenvalue of one. And it has this special normalization condition given by the honesty uh, condition. But the more more sort of special aspect of this as an eigenvector is that it has an eigenvalue of one. That's that's a conspicuous thing. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention uh, is that once you get into this, uh, you you can't come out uh, basically. So in other words. If it's the case that at some time t prime um, you're in the stationary distribution vector, right? Then at later times, so t greater than t prime, um, this is just going to be the same, um, and that's because every time you increment, so let's say t was two steps beyond t prime, and then you increment it. You can increment that by hitting u of t prime twice with the one step transition probability matrix. And each time you don't change the vector because it was already in the stationary state. Okay, uh, now we're going to introduce a, a fairly important theorem called the ergodic theorem. So we'll name this one. which is all about whether or not um, a chain has a stationary uh, distribution, which you can imagine is fairly important to know, to know about. Um, and so this says that if you have some chain, so if you have a Markov chain x t, such that t is 0, 1, 2, and so on, <clears throat> 
if it's ergodic, if the chain itself is ergodic, right? So what that means is it's irreducible and all of its states are states that you will return to and that are aperiodic. So in other words, the states are also ergodic and they're in one class. Um, then there exists a unique stationary distribution vector pi and the following property and it has the following property if you look at the limit that t goes to infinity for any u j so this is this the state distribution vector as a function of t uh, then it will eventually go into the stationary distribution vector and this is equal to 1 over the recurrence time the expected recurrence time for that state um, and again, this is a proof that we won't show. Proof omitted. That's what that's meant to spell. <laughs> okay, so just a couple of comments on this. Um, the first is that you're going to end up in this state, the stationary distribution, regardless of where you started. So u does go to pi regardless of the initial state. For an ergodic uh, Markov chain. Uh, and the other is that uh, once you're in it, so once u is equal to pi, or maybe arbitrarily close to it, um, then pi i, so the ith component of pi, is it what it's telling you is the proportion of time in the future that you'll spend in that state, or the portion of future time spent in that state. So if it was if pi i was 0.3, it means that 30% of the time going forward will be spent in that state. Uh, but you stay, you know, the state distribution vector, you know, has non-zero values for lots of different states potentially, and so those tell you the proportion of time that you'll be in those states. Or you could say you could read that as the probability. Uh, okay. And uh, then just a reminder that finding pi is an eigenvalue problem. Uh, with two conditions. The eigenvalue has to be one and uh, we have this honesty condition. Okay, so that's the ergodic theorem. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a very special case uh, that comes up pretty pretty frequently, uh, which is just a two-state uh, ergodic Markov chain. And so, uh, so this is we'll write down a theorem, or, or sorry, a proposition for how do you what what exactly is its uh, stationary distribution because we can find it exactly. Uh, so this is just a proposition. Uh, maybe it would be better stated as just an example, but we could we'll use it a lot. I think we'll use it later and in the end of this lecture for an example. So I'm going to label this with just a star uh, because we're going to refer to it later. Um, but so the idea is to consider a two a two state <laughs> a two state Markov chain 
a two state chain. So it's probability, uh, one step probability transition, one step transition probability matrix looks like this. So it's got P11, P12, P21, P22, right? I think we usually use those as, write those as lower cases. Probably should do that. Okay, um, for, so for this kind of chain, we can just write out the, uh, st the stationary distribution uh, exactly. Okay, so if the following is true, All right, and so think about what does this mean? Uh, the probability of going from one to two plus the probability of going from two to one is bigger than zero. Uh, so in other words, it's possible to get between the states. Um, so if this is, so it's not a very special condition. Um, if this is true, uh, then we can solve for the stationary distribution. It looks like this. One over P12 plus P21. And then, it's, of course, it's a vector, so it's multiplying P21, P12. Right? And there's a proof for this in your notes. Uh, it's, it's basically a, a straightforward algebra problem. But so we'll leave it, we'll leave it out, so we'll put proof in notes. takes a bit of time to go through all of the different algebra steps, um, but it's it's very straightforward. Okay, uh, and I just want to mention one more thing before we do a sort of a, an example problem that wraps, uh, kind of tries to put everything together. Um, and that's just a remark that we're sometimes going to multiply by the um, one step transition probability matrix multiple times. Um, and so we want to make some remark about how you do that. So remark. It's easiest, so this is sort of a general feature. If you ever have to multiply a matrix against itself a bunch of times, um, in other words, raise, so, so what this is about is raising the matrix P to some power, um, then it's, it's important to diagonalize the matrix. Uh, that makes it a lot easier to do it. And so that's what I'm going to talk about here. So suppose P is a diagonalizable M by M matrix. All right, then what that means then we can write this. We can write it as follows. We can say that P, we can write it in terms of two other, well, three other matrices, Q, D, and then Q inverse, like this, where these different matrices look like this. So first of all, Q inverse is just the inverse of Q. Um, there's some circumstances in which uh, that inverse is actually just the transpose of Q, but that's not generically true. Um, so uh, this we can set this up like as as written, um, where D is a diagonal matrix, and then the two Qs are the inverses of each other, and so but they look specifically like this. Um, how do I want to write this? So column I of Q is a right is the ith right eigenvector of p right and row 
i of q inverse is the ith left eigenvector. of p. Now again, sometimes those uh, columns are just the rows turned turned vertical, um, but not always. It's not always the case, and it won't be the case in our example problem. Um, and d is the following. Uh, it's made up of all of the eigenvalues. And the, the ordering of this is done in terms of the size of the eigenvalues. So um, I think we'll say, how do I write this? So first of all, these are lambda i is ith eigenvalue of p. Um, and what I mean by that is the following. So let's say lambda i is bigger than lambda j in magnitude if i is less than j. All right, so that's how we, that's the convention we use for the ordering. Uh, the biggest eigenvalue is the first one. Um, that's, how you, that's how you put these in order. Um, so this, this is all a bunch of kind of details about how you make those matrices, but what's most important here is just the structure of this, um, where you have a diagonal matrix sandwiched between uh, uh, two things that are the inverse of each other because the following thing happens. So this is probably review for, I would hope, most of you, uh, but maybe not. Um, but so if you think about this, so if you did P squared and you wrote that with the matrix diagonalized, Right, so that's q d q minus one. So that's one power of p, and then q d q minus q inverse, like this. Now, if you multiply uh, these things together, the two inside uh, matrices that hit each other, q inverse and q, those just give back the identity matrix, and so what you get is q d squared q inverse. And the square or, or any power of a diagonal matrix is really simple. Uh, so d squared is diagonal lambda 1 squared, lambda 2 squared, and so on. So that's the utility of diagonalizing a matrix like this, is that it makes it possible, makes it straightforward to uh, raise it to any power. So in other words, p to the n is q d to the n, q inverse, and d to the nth power is just like this, with 2 replaced by n. Like that. All right, so we're going to finish today's lecture with an example problem that kind of wraps all this up. Um, so it's a fun little example. I'll skip some of the algebra steps, uh, but you should probably pause and work through them uh, to make sure that you agree. Uh, but let's suppose, so um, let's suppose we're trying to describe some sort of a machine that it has basically two states of operating, uh, operating correctly or not. Um, so working or not working. So let's consider a two-state machine. I guess this, this part kind of describes most machines. <laughs> they're either working or they're not. Um, and let's, so let's name them. We'll say that state one is not working. So that's called state one and working is state two. Um, and so that that's pretty generic so far, but let's suppose we have a very specific model. Uh, put this over here. And the model looks like this. So let's suppose that, uh, I don't know what I want to start with first. Let's start with the, the graph. Uh, 
Um, if you're in state one, the chance of transitioning into state two is 25%. So 25% probability of going to a working state if you're in a not working state. And um, uh, it, let's say if you're in state uh, two, I think I might have said this backwards. If you're in state two, if you're working, the chance of the thing stopping suddenly not working in the next time step is 10%, right? Um, and so therefore the chance of staying in state two working, if it's already, if it's working, is 90%. And the chance of staying in a broken state or not working state is 75%. Right, and so for this, the one-step transition probability matrix, you can build it pretty fast. Um, so going from one to one is 0 0.75, one to two is a quarter, uh, two to one is 0 0.1, and two to two is 0 0.9. So um, let's suppose that this is the setup and you have that on day zero, uh, when you start things out, so suppose on day zero, and we'll increment time in days, uh, you're in state, or the machine is working. Let's put it in words. So that is to say, um, x0 is equal to 2, right? And uh, we could also write this, the distribution uh, vector, state occupation distribution vector then just looks like this. There's 100% chance that you're in state 2. That's the initial condition. Um, and then let's suppose we try to answer the question, um, what's the probability that the machine is working uh, at some later day, uh, n days later. That seems like a useful thing to know. Right, so let's say that's the goal. I feel like this would be a good uh, um, job interview question or something. All right, so what's the chance, what's the probability that n days later uh, the, the machine is in a working state. It, maybe it wasn't always working in between time zero and time n, um, but what's the probability that it's working n days later? Okay, so the first thing you want to do is solve the eigenvalue problem. Um, you can do it... Um, manually, which you probably should, or you can use the theorem that we had before, or I think it was a proposition for two state chains like this. Um, but the result you should find, um, you could do it on a computer as well, if, if you're like many of us and you just can't be bothered to do eigenvalue problems by hand anymore. Um, this, the, the eigenvalue of one has an eigenvector one one like this and the eigenvalue of two has an eigenvector sorry it's not eigenvalue value of two eigenvalue of 0.65 uh, has an eigenvector minus 2.5 and one now these are uh, column vectors, right? And so the row eigenvectors might look different from this, and, and they will. Uh, but so I'll write out uh, the Q matrix, and you can see. So the Q matrix, which is made up of its rows are made, or sorry, Q has its columns made by the eigenvectors. And so these are 1, 1, and minus 2.5. And one, right? And the inverse of this, q minus one, looks like this: one minus one 
2.5 and 1 multiplied by 1 over 3.5, right? Um, and notice, so where is the stationary distribution vector in all these things? Um, you know, there's a bunch. Of, so, so these are these vectors here, but these are not. These are column vectors. So these are, these are not good candidates. Um, so it should be the rows of this matrix, right? Which one of them? Um, and you should look at them and think for a second what it, what it should be. There's one other condition um, for the stationary distribution vector. It has to be that when you add up all of its components, you get one, right? And so uh, it's this eigenvector. This is the stationary state here when you multiply it by 1 over 3.5, right? And so this thing has the form pi up here and then something else down here, right? So that's where you could read off pi. Um, and p to the n is what we want to use because we want to try to um, increment our state. So the whole idea, right, uh, where's the question? So this thing here, right, this is, I should have written this probably before, uh, not the vector symbol, but uh, u2. Oh, well, how do I want to write this? Uh, let's say, uh, yeah, I'll write it like this, u2n, where un is equal to, oops, not that kind of p, um, the initial u on the left times p to the n. Um, so I didn't write an initial, so let's do that. like that. Um, so I should have said this before I got rolling, before I just dove into trying to do the calculation. I should have I should have explained what we're doing here a little bit better. So the idea, remember, is you're trying to find the probability that you're in state two after n time steps or n days later, right? So that means uh, this, this is the quantity here that you're looking for. And you find that by multiplying the initial distribution vector by the one step transition probability matrix n times. Right, and so that's what we try to do. And so in order to do that, uh, it's easiest to do this with a diagonalized matrix. Like that. All right, so we need to find, we've already found Q and Q minus one. Um, and we found D as well. We just didn't write it out. Um, but we've got that. Okay, so how do we how do we do the, the multiplication? Well, I'll just write it out. And again, I'll skip the algebra here, some of it. Um, so this is u at time zero times p to the n, or in other words, q d to the n. Q inverse. And so this is the row vector 0, 1. That's u at time 0. The Q matrix 1 minus 2.5. Sorry, that's a negative sign, not a not minus. <laughs> 1, 1. The diagonal matrix 1 and then 0 0.65 to the nth power, and then uh, the inverse of q, 1, 2.5, minus 1, 1, all over 3.5, like that. Right? And that's the answer. So if you wanted to, uh, if you knew n, uh, you could go ahead and multiply this through, or you could I don't know, you could pass through some of these things. You could clean this up a little bit, but without n, you can't really finish. Um, although I could, I guess I could uh, do this. Let's see, I can put this in here like this. So that's just one, and there's an n above that, 0 0.65 to the nth power. Okay, and so what does this work out to? Well, I'll do a little bit of the tidying.
uh, you get. And again, you should pause and see if you can verify this. Like that. All right, so, and the thing we're after, um, right, so the probability of being in state two after n steps is only one of those components, right? It's the second one. So that's 5 sevenths plus 2 sevenths times 0 0.65 to the n. And so you can see it gets smaller as time goes on uh, because 6 0.65 every time you raise it by a power uh, gets smaller. And, but it has a limiting value, right? And so that limiting value is the stationary distribution uh, or a component of the stationary distribution vector. So in other words, notice, I mean, it's, it probably should have been one of the other questions. Um, what happens as time goes to infinity? This becomes pi, and that becomes equal to 2 sevenths, 5 sevenths. And if you were to, so this agrees, with the little proposition we wrote for two state chains, uh, like the one that we've got. So if you look back and find that proposition and go through the work, uh, and you, you should do that. Um, you'll see that this gives the same result. Okay, that's all for today.